his his message to Habakkuk. Now, just to give you some some feedback for those of you that haven't been with us, we've been going verse by verse through the book of Habakkuk, and um, Habakkuk is really it's a lament. So that means that it's a cry for help, or it's a cry of complaint. Actually, um, this is a part of biblical literature uh, is complaining. Um, God knew who we were and what we needed So a part of biblical literature is dedicated to the complaining of people And uh, it just is So if you feel bad about complaining, don't feel bad God wants to hear your complaints And that's what Habakkuk is Habakkuk is a long complaint He starts off saying, God, I don't think you're watching I don't think you're present I don't think you're active in this world There's so much craziness going on and this is, this is the perfect 2020 book of the Bible. This is 2020 uh, scripture right here. It's written specifically for us. Because Habakkuk says, I don't, I don't think you're doing anything. And then God answers him in chapter 1, and he says, no, I am doing something, and this is what I'm doing. Well, when Habakkuk learns what God is up to, Habakkuk strongly disagrees with God's plan. Uh, which is why I think one of the, that's one of the reasons God doesn't tell us his plans because if he did tell us his plans we would so strongly disagree with his reasoning and with his plans because his ways are higher than our ways his thoughts are higher than our ways but God reveals to Habakkuk what he's doing and Habakkuk says whoa, 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 whoa this is not okay you shouldn't you know, this, you're, you're, you're clearly losing it god you're, you're not doing what's right well chapter two is god's response to habakkuk's response to god's response is that confusing enough all right so that's what chapter two is and chapter two finally gets through to habakkuk and chapter two is one of those chapters in the bible that is just not very um encouraging in fact, God is, is issuing several woes. There are five woes. Five times that God says, woe to this person, woe to that person, woe to this person. Five times that God says, these people are actually in trouble. Like, you think things are going well for them. And you're concerned about them, but actually this is not going to turn out well. And God is not necessarily condemning them as much as he is warning Habakkuk about focusing on the temporary, focusing on the here and now. So this is a great message for 2020 because God does not want you focused on 2020. You might be living in 2020, but there's more to your life and more to God's plans than the year 2020. So whatever is happening in this year, you need to know that God has a bigger perspective for your life. And that's what God's telling Habakkuk. God's saying, look, let me give you a little perspective. Let's zoom out just a little bit. And let me tell you what's really happening. These people seem to be succeeding. These lawlessness seems to be uh, accepted. And there's, there's, there's craziness that seems seems to be going on but god says no there's actually trouble for people that are not submitted to god and so the final woe is this starts here in verse 18 where god says of what value uh, is an idol carved by a craftsman or an image that teaches lies for the one who makes it trusts in his own creation he makes idols that cannot speak what's he talking about he's talking about idolatry he's talking about idols Especially in those days, idols were uh, literal statues of certain fantastic beings that people in their um, very active imagination created. Uh, some were, you know, human bodies with like alligator heads. Some were, uh, had wings. Some had these strange otherworldly type bodies. They, they, they were idols and, and it was believed that they were a representation of a, an actual spirit. So it, nobody really thought that these idols were technically living. They saw them as a representation of a, of a spiritual realm that they believed was real. So they had different gods, especially in the Middle East, and you read about them, them in Scripture, and they had these different gods which they believed were spiritual beings, but that they inhabited this stone figure for a while, or this golden figure, or whatever it may be. And so you go pray to the golden figure, and the god that, that the golden figure represents will hear your prayer and will, will answer accordingly. And they had several different gods, and this is what God's coming against. God says, of what value are these stone uh, statues or gold statues or bronze statues or wood and he kind of issues some of them he says for the one who makes it actually trusts in his own creation he makes idols that cannot speak and then verse 19 is our woe he says woe to him who says to the wood come to life or to lifeless stone wake up 
Can it give guidance? That's, that's the NIV. In the New King James, it, it, it actually quotes the person. He says, Woe to him who says to lifeless stone, Wake up, it will teach us. And in the, in the NIV, God is asking the question, Can it give you guidance? Will it really teach you? It is covered, he says, with gold and silver. There is no breath in it. Verse 20, But the Lord is in his holy temple. This is this is a this is a this is a, a distinction. This is a contrast. God is pitting uh, the 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 pagan idols against himself, and specifically against his temple. He says, "Look, these these stone things, these these gold things, these things you have constructed, they can't. Uh, they have no breath in them." What value are they? He says, but the Lord, this is, this is, he's talking about himself, is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. Um, let's, let's go quickly to 1 Peter. If you have a Bible, you can go there. If not, it'll, I believe it'll be on your screen. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 5. Those of you that were with us on Wednesday night prayer, uh, you might know where I'm going with this. I read this. I kind of got fired up during prayer. So, um, Anyway, uh, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse, let's start at verse 6. He says, Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. This is in contrast to idols. Humble yourself, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all of your care upon him, for he cares for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him. Not run from him, resist him. Usually if a lion were to come up to me, I would probably start running. But he says, resist him. How do we do that? By standing steadfast in your faith. It's going to take some wild faith to come up against a wild animal of an enemy. He says, resist him by standing. Did you know that the greatest resistance you can have to the devil in your life is not to move forward even? He didn't say resist him by pressing forward. He didn't say resist him by taking out the sword of the Spirit and slicing him up and dicing him. He says resist him by standing your ground. Sometimes just simply standing in what you know to be true is enough to scare the devil away from your life. The adversary cannot come against a Christian who is standing on his faith. You might feel like 2020, you haven't been taking many steps forward. Well, that's fine. The question is, are you still standing in the faith that you had in 2019? If you're still standing in the same place, this is what resistance looks like. This is what uh, spiritual warfare looks like. It is to stand in your faith. And if you've had faith, that's good. But wild faith is the kind of faith that can handle the weight of your entire life standing on it, resting on it, standing steadfast in your faith. This is how we resist the devil. He says you've got to st stand in your faith knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the, in the world. In other words, knowing that we're all in this together. You're stuck in 2020? Me too. You're in the middle of a pandemic? Me too. No matter where you are in the world right now, we are all in this together. We are all suffering together. We are all dealing with hardship together. We're all dealing with heartbreak together. We're all dealing with, with, with loss, loss of employment, loss of finances, loss of friends, loss of spouses, loss of, loss of children, loss of, of loved ones. We're all, deal, we're all dealing with the same things. And this is what he says. You need to, you need to keep that in mind because otherwise you'll think the devil's picking on you. Otherwise you'll think that, that the life is picking on you. Otherwise you'll start to get self-pity. You'll feel sorry for yourself. You cannot stand on your faith and feel sorry for yourself at the same time. You need to recognize everybody's going through something. Come on. Everybody's going through something. You might not even know what they're going through, but everybody's going through something. You know everybody's dealing with a secret battle. They don't necessarily publicize it. They might not tweet it. Not everybody whines about it on Facebook all the time. All right? And everybody's going through something, though. And, and what they're going through, you need to remember that. Because when you remember that, you realize that the enemy isn't picking on you specifically. That everyone is under attack. That everyone is, is, that everyone is in a battle. 
Habakkuk, look, it's not just you. It's not just your city. It's not just your time frame. All people ever since Adam and Eve have been under attack, and you need to realize that. And so when you stand on your faith, recognize that you're not only sta- you're not standing alone. You're locked arm in arm with other believers all around the world that are facing the same enemy, the same hardships. But I like verse, I like verse 10 where he finally redirects it to the place where our faith needs to be re- re- redirected. He says, but may the God of all grace... So you're you're, you're facing all kinds of battles. Well, there is a God of all grace. May the God of all grace who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a little while, may he do a couple of things. May he perfect you. May he establish you. May he strengthen you. And may he settle you. And to him will be all the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. That's what he says. That's that's what he said. I, I wasn't saying it, but you can go ahead and say it. He said, Amen. And all God's people say, because this is the point. This is the focus of our faith. That He has all glory. He has all dominion. He has all power. He has all grace. And He's called us into His glory. And the beauty of that, the majesty of that, can, when you focus on that, it will overshadow the darkness. It'll overshadow the fight. It'll overshadow the attack. It'll overshadow whatever you're facing. And so to go back to Habakkuk, God says, look, there are some people that in the midst of the fight, they're responding wrongly to the fight. Specifically, he says they're calling on idols. Did you you catch that in verse uh, 19? Woe to him who says to the wood. Woe to him who says to stone. Woe to him who calls out. Now, the danger of idolatry is modern Christians can think that we, this doesn't apply to us. Or it applies in kind of a spooky way. Like I've known, and maybe it's just that I, I, I've grown up in charismania, uh, kind of charismatic land, charismatic Christianity. You know, people, I have known people that, that consider themselves to be very spiritual. And when they walk into somebody's house, this actually happened with one of the members of City Chapel. Somebody walked into their house and noticed some uh, kind of pagan type knickknacks. You know, like little, like, I, th- I think it might have been like a little Buddha or something sitting on the table. And this person who's very spiritual was so concerned about the knickknack. It's interesting to me that, that Jesus didn't say, woe to him who collects idols. Your, your house apparently might be full of little gold statues and stone stuff and, and he, he doesn't say woe to him who collects idols or I've had people say oh no, there's, a, there's a dream catcher in that window we need to, we need to pray over that house because it's a, it's a portal for the demonic spirits to get in it's a portal the demonic spirit going to get right in through that dream catcher they're going to go right in because you know the origins of a dream catcher you know it comes from like, like, the, like the, the Native American Indians and their paganism and their cult they believe that it attracted good spirits and kept out bad spirits so obviously the devil's going to get right in through that dream catcher. They're going to get in. We've got, we got, we got, we got to curse and bind it up and block it. And, 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 and it's like, well, wait, wait a minute. We can get so, we can think we're so spiritual by being so carnal. By carnal, I mean physical. Like we're so physical. This, this, like this thing is not a portal. This, this right here is not a portal for the enemy. Now, now certainly there are things that beyond my understanding. There's stuff I don't quite get. So I walk, tr- I tread carefully around some of that stuff. But sometimes I think we, we actually do ourselves a disservice because God is, God is not as concerned of, about the knickknacks in your house as he is about what your heart calls upon when it gets in trouble. God is more concerned about the call of your heart than the collection within your house. And certainly, I don't have a picture of Krishna in my house. I wouldn't recommend it. I don't think it's a great idea. But at the same time, if you're so focused, and if you think that taking down a picture of Krishna, putting it in the trash is somehow going to close off all the portals to your house. No, the portals of the enemy are sin. The portals of the enemy are compromise. It's lies. It's when you come into agreement with satanic powers. That's when Satan is allowed access into your life. It has nothing to do with your knickknacks or your window art or whatever you, kind of bedspread you might have. Well, there's triangles on that. That's the Illuminati. No, like it's not like every... It's not... It's It's not like that. 
This is not how the spirit realm works. You give access by the agreement of your heart and the words of your mouth. I mean, that's salvation, right? Whoever, whoever sp- speaks with his mouth, declares with his mouth, and believes in his heart, he shall be saved. Well, if that's how it works on the good side, that's also how it works on the bad side. What your heart calls upon becomes what you worship. Your idol. And so in this sense, let me tell you, idolatry is not dead. We're not, we, we may not be crafting, you know, like little Buddhas and putting them around our houses and bowing down. That, that's not idolatry. Idolatry is what your heart calls to. What does your heart call to and say, awake? What does your heart call to and say, come alive? What does your heart come to and say, it will teach, it will instruct, it will guide, it will affirm, it will deliver, it will illuminate? What does your heart call to? And that's why, like last week's sermon, you know, might have hit some nerves because I touched on the, the fact that many of our hearts are calling to like an elephant or a donkey. <laughs> the election's coming up and many of our hearts are calling to either an elephant or a donkey. We believe if the elephant can get into the room, apparently it's already in the room, but if the elephant can get into the room, like even more, like more of its big, like, you know, like if more of the elephant can fill the room, then, then we call to that and that will secure our freedom. That will secure our peace. That will bring restoration. That will be our hope. Others of us, we're really tired of that and we prefer more of the donkey. And so, you know, we, 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 we call, <laughs> there's other, this King James version, but you know, we, we prefer the donkey and we're crying out for the donkey. And man, if the donkey can just get into power and the donkey can just step into certain rooms and certain places, then there will be peace. Then there will be hope. Then there won't be crazy tweets anymore. Then suddenly everything will line up and we're calling to it saying, come alive, rise up for me, stand up for me, guide me, speak to me, teach me, tell me who I am. Tell me what my value is. And so I'm not against voting. Like, you know, voting is good. But when, the, when, when your vote, when so much hope hangs on your vote, this is what is wrong. Because your heart is yearning for the donkey or for the elephant. For those of you in New Zealand, I'm talking about like left and right, you know, Republican, Democrat. I'm, thinking, like, I'm not actual, this isn't a zoo. <laughs> America might look like a zoo, guys, but it's really not. I mean, sure, like we sort of, like we we sort of know what's going on sometimes. But uh, but you know, like we we put our hope in these things. We, we call on these things. We say, "Rise up!" It's interesting. God says, God says about them. He says, "There's no breath in them." A lot of things God could have said. There's no whatever. Right? There's no blood in them. There's no their eyes don't work. Their ears don't work. A lot of things. And Isaiah actually kind of deals with some of that. But but here God just says he picks one thing. He says there's no breath. The Hebrew word for breath is rucha. It's the same word for spirit. In fact, in Genesis one one it says in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth and the the rucha of God, or the spirit of God, or the breath of God hovered over the face of the deep. So this is, this is a definition of an idol. Whatever you call upon that does not have the Spirit of God in it, that's an idol. And it, and it might be a political platform. It might be a political ideology even. It might, be, it, may, it might be the teachers, right? You know, like you listen to like Ben Shapiro, and so he's going to tell me, you know, he's going to give me, if I can just listen to him, then I can know what I need to know, and I can think what I need to think. If I can just watch this particular guy, and I can think what I can, if I can just listen to Jordan Pearson, then I can figure out what I need to figure out. And the truth is, like, all of, there's some good stuff in all of this stuff, but, the, but it cannot be what you call upon. It cannot be what your heart yearns for when you're in trouble. If it is, then that's an idol. And I have good news for you. God's been breaking down idols for thousands and thousands of years. If you're in this room today, you're like, I think I might have an idol in my life. Well, hey, you know, most of us probably do. It's so accepted in our culture. It's so promoted in our culture. From the very time that we're kids watching TV, we're constantly being told that this idol, this one's worthy of worship, this one, if you worship this one, then you'll be happy. And it, and it it starts with like possessions, right? Like if you, if you can just get that car, if you can just get that house, if you can just get that certain number in your bank account, then you'll have financial security. And so the, the number will speak to you. It'll tell you that you're safe. It'll tell you that you're, that, you're, that you're prepared for whatever might come up. It'll tell you that you're ready. It'll tell you that you'll always have enough. It'll tell you, it'll speak to you. But then if the number doesn't get there, it starts telling you all kinds of other things. Oh my goodness, I might not have enough. Oh my goodness, God might not provide. Oh my goodness, I, I, might, be in, I might be on the edge of disaster. Because, because whatever we call upon is what speaks to us. Our idol is speaking to us. 
But that's why in verse 18, God says it's lying. He says these are lying idols. One, they offer you things that they don't deliver. They say, look, if, if you get this certain possession, you get this car, you get this house, get that promotion. It, it, it's, it's diff- different things can become idols because it's not just things. Sometimes it's friends. Sometimes there are a number of single people. It's like if I could just get married, right, then marriage would speak to me. Marriage would tell me that I am enough. Marriage would validate me. Marriage would make me not lonely. Marriage would would make me secure in myself. Marriage would make me bold in who I am. Marriage would speak and it would tell me something about myself. It will guide me. And 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 it is a dangerous place to be in because as somebody who is married, it doesn't... It, it, it speaks to you, but it's not always speaking the truth. Great marriages will speak to you, but they will not speak the truth. Because they're telling you something from a certain perspective. They're telling you something from a certain performance. In fact, a lot of like marriage counseling, honestly, it's like me and Ro sitting down with, with another couple, and almost always one of those couples has something that they're calling on to speak to them, to guide them. They have an idol. And usually both of them have some kind of idol because most of us have some kind of idols. And so as, I, as we sit down with them, honestly, a lot of times marriage problems come from, from literally people worshiping each other. And she is looking at him and calling on him. If he can just rise up and be the man of God he's supposed to be, then our kids won't be dirty little pagans. If he can just, you know, my, our, kids would, well, our kids would figure it out if he wouldn't just be so darn like, like lost and not caring. And if he would, and they're calling on him and they're bowing down to him. They wouldn't say that. Sometimes she doesn't even like him. But she's worshiping what she doesn't even like because she's calling on it. She believes that it will speak. It will guide. It will declare. It will affirm. It it will appropriate. And she's looking at him and he's, he's over here. He's looking at her. And he's like, man, if, if I can just do enough to make her happy, if I can just get the dishes and do the laundry and pick the kids, if I can just be in all the places at all the right times, if she can be happy, she will speak to me. She will tell me who I am. She will affirm me. She will validate me. She will teach. She will guide. If I can just, if I can just get it right. And so both are worshiping each other. They don't even like each other anymore, but they're both worshiping each other because they're longing for what only God can give. They're longing for it. You and I have a longing to, we're designed to worship. That's part of our, that's part of our, 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 our kids, our, our, our parenting small group this week. You're designed for worship. You're designed for worship. No other species does what humans do. That's what he was talking about in our, in our parenting class. You know, like they, there's, there, are, there are penguins in Antarctica, for instance, that will, that will jump off of like a really high ledge and they'll do this perfect dive right into the water and they, they land so perfect there's hardly any splash. And it's, and it's awesome. And it's like, how do they know to do that? I don't know. But they just do it. And none of the other penguins stand around and, 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 and applaud. Like you don't see it. You don't see other penguins holding up 9.8. His toes, his, his flippers were curled. I don't know. I think I'll give him a 9.7, you know. Yeah, he, he, his facial expression wasn't quite right as he, as he, as he hit the water. Like, they don't, they don't do that. Like, you know, the bear's out there catching fish, you know. They're, the big black bear just scoops in there and gets this. It's amazing to watch. Like, Sam, have you tried to catch a fish? <laughs> it's crazy. You know, I, got, I, I got a nine-year-old boy. Obviously, I've tried. It's really hard. And they'll sit there and just be like, bam. Like, and they'll just catch a fish. And the other fish, the other bears are on the side just going, eh. They're not like, man, I really like the way big bear, black bear does it, man. He's awesome. Boy, I tell you, someday I want to grow up be like him. Like, they don't do that. Humans are the only ones that will sit in front of a TV, watch a guy hike a football, hopefully by God's grace, this Thursday, hike a football. I'm just, I'm just praying right now. He's going to speak that in the atmosphere. There will be a guy on Thursday hiking a football. He's going to drop back, and, and, and he's going to throw it, right? And he's going to throw this ball. There's going to be this other guy who's like crazy fast, faster than anybody in this room, and he's going to run super fast. He's going to jump with one hand. I think, I think Texas State, did you see that catch by Texas State yesterday? It was insane. The guy, I mean, he, he in the back of the end zone, one hand grab, pulls it in. His butt lands in bounds in the back corner, and the rest of his body is out, but it's a touchdown because it's just his rear end. Like, it's awesome. And you watch replay after replay, you're like, that's awesome. Why? Why do we do that? Because we were created to stand back and say, wow. 
We were created to be awed. We were created to be inspired. We were created to look at something that's greater than us. It's like, Psh, I could never do that, but that's really cool. That's amazing. That's why, that's, that's why certain cars cost more, because we're created to stand back and go, man, that's so much better than my Honda, you know, like that. Wow, look at that. Like, that's why certain houses cost more, and they're in different neighborhoods. We're like, wow, when I drive into this neighborhood, it feels so much different than my other neighborhood. Like, that's why certain churches, like, that's why we have screens up here, because, because you know, we could just put lyrics, like, like, on one screen, but we got nine screens because it's, like, cool, you know? And it's not just practical. We desire things to be beautiful and to be awe-inspiring, to walk in and go, wow. We were created for that because we were created for God. And God is Wow. And God is awe-inspiring. And God is, did you just see that? And God is, I can't believe he did that. God is awe-inspiring. And he inspires awe. He, he, and, 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 but the problem with idolatry is we are wowed by lesser things. We are inspired by lesser things. And these things do not pro- give what they promise. They do not, they cannot fulfill us. And so what I love about 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 scripture the scripture teaches us that so isaiah 55 and uh, we went, went through this in our in our small group this week just real quick uh isaiah 55 um let me see where is that passage uh just starting at verse one god here is calling out to his people he says come all who are thirsty come to the waters you who have no money come and buy and eat <laughs> come and buy stuff without money Come buy wine and milk without money, without costs. And verse 2 is really important. He says, Why do you spend money on what is not bread? And your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me. Eat what is good, and you will delight in the richest of fare. In other words, God has amazing things for us. And one of the reasons... See, God, when he's, when he's condemning idolatry, it's not from an objective kind of, Well, that's just wrong. It's from, it's from the reality that you're not going to get what you want from it. And God intended you to have what you're desiring. God intended you to be awed. God intended you to be inspired. God intended for you to be content and fulfilled. God intended for you to be excited and thrilled and fired up. God intended for you, and God intended for him to provide all those things for you. And he's looking at you and says, Woe to the one who calls on the wood because he's just not going to get it. He's not going to receive it. It's not going to fulfill him. And we see how this plays out actually in Daniel chapter 5 for the Babylonians. Daniel chapter 5 is a crazy story that I talked about last week where Belshazzar, which is Nebuchadnezzar's son, <clears throat> Nebuchadnezzar is the current king uh, here in, 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 in Habakkuk's time. Nebuchadnezzar is crushing all of the Middle East and, and just taking Babylon to the next level. He is conquering everybody, right? And God... God deals with Nebuchadnezzar because Nebuchadnezzar becomes very prideful. Well, Nebuchadnezzar turns to God and he, he humbles himself and he admits that God is God. And so we talked about that story a couple weeks ago. Well, Be- Be- uh, Nebuchadnezzar has a son named Belshazzar. Belshazzar knows everything that happened, but he does not humble himself. He doesn't turn to God. Instead, he lives his life for himself, specifically calling on these other idols and praising these other idols for the good stuff that he has received. And God is quiet. God's silent. God's listening. God's watching, right? And then in Daniel chapter 5, finally, uh, Belshazzar just pushes the limit too far. He goes too far. He has this massive party with a thousand of his nobles and his wives and his concubines, and he orders for the uh, the, the utensils, the, the cups and the saucers and the plates from the temple in Israel, from, the, from, from God's temple to be taken to him for them to use uh, in their party. And so they wait and wait and wait. And finally, everybody <clears throat> comes together. They get all the gold stuff, all the silver stuff, and they, they're, they're drinking wine from it, and they're celebrating using the holy articles from the temple. And then it says that he begins to praise the gods of silver and gold. And suddenly, this hand comes down from heaven, this giant hand, this disattached from a body, it spooks him, it freaks him out, and starts carving into the wall next to him these words. And there are these words. We talked about the words last week. 
Well, somebody, somebody says, why don't we call in Daniel? He's an Israelite. Maybe he can interpret this. And so they call in Daniel, and Daniel interprets it. But before he does, he gives them a little sermon. So last week I gave you the interpretation, but today I just want to give you part of the sermon. He says, he says, but you, Belshazzar, his son, Nebuchadnezzar's son, you have not humbled yourself. You have not humbled yourself, though you knew all of this. Instead, you have set yourself up against the Lord of heaven. You had the goblets from his temple brought to you, and you and your nobles, your wives, your concubines, drank wine from them. You praised the gods made of silver and gold, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone, which cannot see, hear, or understand. But, and this is the real problem, you did not honor the God who holds in his hand your life and all of your ways. Therefore, he sent the hand. Did you catch that? This, this is what stuck out to me Wednesday night. I was reading that, and I said, wait a minute. You did not honor the God who holds in his hand your life and all of your ways. Therefore, he sent the hand to write the inscription. So that tells me that all of us are responding to the hand of God in some way. There is a hand that has been holding you all of your life. There is a hand that has been protecting you all of your life. There's a hand that's got you to where you are. There's a hand that has conceived you in his mind and carried you to this place. And we are all responding to that hand in some way. Some of us are reaching out for that hand and holding that hand. And some of us are rejecting that hand and desiring to be removed from that hand. And Belshazzar rejected the hand. But either way, you do not escape the hand of God. And so the hand came down to Belshazzar, not to hold him, but to judge him. And so my, my encouragement for you today is that, is that there is a hand that's been holding you, and I would, I would encourage you to reach out for that hand, to hold the hand that's been holding you. Real faith is when we hold on to the hand that has actually been holding us all of our life. Real faith is to recognize that there has been a hand. If you're here today and if you're in your right mind, that's because there's been a hand carrying you to this place. If you're here today and you're alive, that's because there's been a hand that has kept you alive. If you're here today and your faculties, your legs, and your arms work, it, that is because if you're here today and you have the internet, that's because there's been a hand that has been moving in your life and sheltering you, even if you didn't recognize it. Belshazzar was not a Christian, yet he was in the hand of God. God He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole wide world in his hands. Because you don't have to be righteous to be in his hand. You don't have to be holy to be in his hand. The, the, your righteousness or your holiness is based on how you respond to the hand that has been carrying you. And God says, look, I've been waiting, Belshazzar, for you to reach out for my hand. For you to put your faith in my hand. For you to honor me and honor the hand that's been holding you. But because you will not honor my hand, my hand is coming down to judge you. So the hand that holds you is also the hand that ends up pointing at you. The judge is also the primary witness on the stand. And so wherever you are today, this is, this is my prayer Wednesday night. I just want to reach out and I want to hold on to the hand that's been holding me. I want to put faith in the one who has been believing in my potential all of my life. I want to believe in him. I want to reach out for him because he's been holding me. I want to hold on to the one who's been holding on to me. And you can, you can do that right now. Belshazzar had an opportunity to do that. And that's the implication of the next verses. You've been weighed. You've been measured. I've been waiting. I've been watching for you to reach out for this hand. I've been waiting and watching for you to put faith in this hand. So at any given moment, you are in the hand of God. If you're wondering how far away you are from the hand of God, well, how far away you're right in the palm of his hand. And it doesn't take... It doesn't take a million miles to get into his hand. You are in the palm of his hand. You merely have to reach out for that hand. You have to connect with that hand. Put faith in the hand. Hold on to the hand that's been holding on to you. And that's what, that's what Peter is telling us in Peter, uh, 1 Peter chapter 5. He says, humble yourself, therefore, under the mighty hand of God. Under the mighty hand of God. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. Of God, there, there, there is a hand that you can come under this morning. There, no matter where you feel like you are, you might feel like you're a million miles away from God. You can come under right now. You can humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. 
today, no matter what you've done, no matter where you've been, no matter what's been going on in your life, you can, you can choose today to humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. What is the mighty hand of God? Well, the mighty hand of God is, is several things, obviously. The mighty, it's mighty. And I, I, think it, I think that stands for His power. His hand stands for His power. It's a symbol of His strength. In the, in, in, in the Old Testament, it said that the Lord has bared his right arm, right? He's pulled up his sleeves because he's about to show himself powerful. And so, so that his hand is a symbol of his, of his power. And, and Peter, who wrote this, he would have understood that a little bit, right? Peter would, have, Peter would have known about the power of God because Peter was in the boat when Jesus was asleep at the back of the boat and the winds picked up and a mighty storm came through and they felt like they were drowning these these trained fishermen and men of the sea believed themselves to be in mortal danger so they went and woke up Jesus and Jesus stood up and he held his hand out and he spoke he rebuked the wind and he spoke to the waves and said peace be still in other words in other words the power of God is such that he will rebuke your enemies for your sake. And that's what he says in the Old Testament. Malachi, he says, I'll rebuke the devourer for your sake. I'll come again. I'll fight your battles. This is to be under the hand of God is to recognize that God is fighting my battles. I don't have to fight all of my battles because there is a hand that is over me that is fighting the battles for me. This removes worry from my life. This removes anxiety from my life because it's no longer totally up to me. My job is to stay under the hand. The hand's job is to deal with every enemy that comes up against me. Is to rise up in judgment against every tongue that, 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 that comes against me, that, that, that accuses me. And this is why I believe God says, but the Lord is in His holy temple. He tells Habakkuk, look, I understand that the Babylonians are at the gate, but God is in the temple. Remember, Habakkuk is in Judah. That's where, in Jerusalem, that's where the temple was. And so God says, look, I understand what's out in front of you. I understand what you're facing. But right in the middle of your town is a temple and God is there. In the Old Testament, see, nowadays we think of God in the temple. We think of that as, as, as a bit of a restriction. Because we're so used to the Holy Spirit that He's with us all the time. But in those days, when God was in the temple, that meant the doctor was in the office. When God was in the temple, that meant God was near. When God was in the temple, that meant you had access. It wasn't the same kind of access we have today, but it was more access than anyone in all of human history had ever had before. God is in His temple. There is a place that you can turn and look and you can see the, the glory cloud hovering over this temple and you know that the presence of God is there and you know that that's where forgiveness is. You can go sacrifice animals. You can worship there and receive forgiveness. You know that that's where healing happens. You know that that's where uh, peace comes from with God and with other people. Reconciliation happens right there. And so Habakkuk is looking at the gate and he here comes the Babylonians and God says, look, I understand what's at the gate, but if you knew the power that was behind you, you wouldn't fear the enemy that's in front of you because behind you, the Lord is still in his temple. He hasn't gone anywhere. He's still available to you. And this is the power of God. There's a hand of God over your life that if you will come under his hand, that if you will come under his power, you will, you will see what he can do. You will see his, his provision for you. He has great power of, for, for provision. Through all of my life, like that saw all my life, He's been faithful. I'm thankful for His provision over my life. And I'm not saying that He has always given me everything I wanted. <laughs> but I am saying that He's always, that my God have all, has always supplied my needs according to His riches and glory. I can share so many crazy stories about His provision when I'm under His hand. When I'm submitted under his hand, when I'm not chasing my ego and things that would make me feel better, when I come under his hand, there is so much provision there, right? Like we started City Chapel five and a half years ago, and, you know, we had to raise a lot of money because it takes a lot of money to start a church, and so we cashed in our 401k, like we got rid of everything, and, you know, we just, we just went all in. And if you're starting a church and you're watching this, Jeremy, you got you like, you to go all in. And you don't know if it's going to work. And you don't know what you're going to be doing for a job if it doesn't work. And you just go all in. And so we went all in. And we're all in. And we're living in San Marcos, but like out toward Wimberley, like, like, you know, 45 minutes from here. And I'm driving up every day to meet people for coffee and to counsel and to share with people and to pray with people and blah, 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 all the stuff that you do. And then every Sunday we're driving up to go to the Cinemark Theater uh, and I got the big trailer behind me. And it's a long trip. And so we began praying that God would open up a door for us to get a house closer 
Now, we've always flipped homes, so we've always bought, like, trash, junk homes, and fixed them up, and then sold them. That's how we've been able to live as people and pastors under the same salary. So we had a house that we were like, man, we're going to make some money on this house. And we were hoping to make, I think it was around $40,000. It's going to be one of our biggest houses ever. It was going to be awesome. It was going to be epic. And uh, it's five acres out toward Wimberley. And, but, you know, making $40,000 is a lot of money, and that makes for a pretty good down payment. So we began looking for a house that we could get. Now, the problem is our salary at the church was 1200 a month, so it's pretty pitiful. So banks wouldn't really give us a loan at $1,200 a month. I don't know if you've tried that, but um, they kind of look at you and go, eh, I don't think, I don't think you can afford this. So we, you know, it, it, we were just, we were just looking and looking and looking. And so finally we find these 14 acres where we're currently living, the house that we've had. And uh, six months after starting the church, we find these 14 acres and uh, he's asking a reasonable price, but everything's so darn expensive around here. And we tell him, well, we really can't pay that. And he's like, well, how much could you pay? Well, we could pay like 100000 less than what you're asking. And he's going to own her finance. And this is how much you know, we make every month. It's you know, not a whole lot. And he's like, well, okay. And so he had full cash offers for what he was asking, but they were all investors. They were going to chop up the land and sell it. And we were going to keep it as a horse farm because my wife loves horses. And, and so he really liked that idea. So he said, look, I really like what you guys are going to do with the place. So, okay, I'll sell it to you for 100000 less, but... And we're like, what? And he's like, but we, we have to close within 30 days, and you need to have $100,000 down on the day of closing. And we had $1,000 in the bank on a good day. It was somewhere between like $100 and $1,000 based on how we were doing that month, you know. And so we looked at it. It's Saturday night. We looked at each other. We're like, where are we going to get $100,000? We don't have $100,000. We said, well, we, we have to sell our property for a little bit more than we thought you know we're gonna have to raise the price and just see what happens and so sunday morning we tell people in the church would you guys pray for us because we're going to try to sell our house for kind of a crazy price and and uh, just see what happens and um and so monday morning i'm at starbucks go, going on the mls because we didn't have internet because when you're making 1200 a month you don't have internet at your house so you use starbucks internet so i'm getting us on the mls and uh one of our friends one of the members of the church they knew somebody who had visited one time blah 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 they came through they loved it they met with roe and there and so roe was like the realtor roe played realtor and they said look we love it like how much how much are you asking and so she's like well we have to have this amount of money and uh they're like well okay well that sounds good and like well we have to close within 28 days they're like okay that sounds good and we're like well could we close at the same closing place where we're going to be closing at this other yeah sure so 28 days later we walk into this place in San Marcos, we close, we get a $100,000 check, we walk across the hall to this other room, we give them the $100,000 check, and we close on our property. It's absolutely bizarre. This property, which by the way was ag exempt, which means there's no, like, there, well, there's a few taxes, but not much at all. Our, our mortgage went down 500 a month. We got a house that was worth a lot more and, and a mortgage that went down significantly. And which was great because right about that time promised land stopped giving me an extra $500 a month. So that was good, you know, and it's just like God has always provided for us. God has always met our needs. God has always come through. His provision is perfect. His timing is perfect. His ways are perfect. And when you come under the mighty, the mighty hand of God, it is really mighty. It's powerful. It's provisional. If that's a word, it, 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 it starts with a P, so that's got to work. And, and, it's, and it's also, like, it's, it's, it's also, there's great protection under his hand. It's great protection. Like, you, you, you're, you're not responsible for deciding what comes into your life and what doesn't. Because when you're under the hand of God, it says under the shadow of his wings, I will find rest, I'll find peace, I'll find protection. I'll come under the shadow, I'll come under his hand. When I'm under his hand, anything that comes into my life has already been okayed by him. So any circumstance, any issue that comes up in my life, I know that he's already passed through him, so he must have a plan for it, he must have a, something he wants to do with it. And there's so much security in that. There's so much protection in that. There's so much guarding in that. Like, like I feel like he is, I don't know, what's the scripture? That he is a, a shield around me. He is a shield around. That, that means it completely goes around, in front of me, behind me, to my left and to my right, underneath me, over me. He's, he's protecting me. He's not isolating me from problems, but he's protecting me in the midst of problems. 
He's, he's with me in the middle of the storm. Sometimes I, I go through deep waters, but he doesn't leave me. Sometimes, sometimes I'm in tough situations, but I know even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because you are with me. His hand is over me. And it's, a, it's a mighty hand. And so I'm not living under my circumstances. I'm living in my circumstances, but under the mighty hand of God. Circumstances are not over me. His hand is over me. And out of His hand comes everything that the idols promise but don't deliver. Out of His hand comes joy. Out of His hand comes pleasure. Out of His hand comes fulfillment. Out of His hand comes comes identity. Out of His hand comes a realization of who I am and what I'm made for. Out of His hands comes a future and a hope. Out of His hand... See, I don't have to worry about tomorrow because He's already stepped into to tomorrow. So the same hand that holds my future is also holding me. And it's the same hand, which means He's guarding me and protecting me and leading me. Because in His hand is provision in his hand is power in his hand is protection and in his hand is a purpose for me a plan for me he he knows what tomorrow holds he's already stepped into my future and made a way he's already gone before me and he steps into my tomorrow and peter knew a little bit about that too he knew a little bit about the power of god the power of the hand of god because one, because one day they were they were sitting around and they were everybody was hungry, and nobody had brought anything to eat. And one of the disciples, I don't know, probably Peter, went up to Jesus and said, "Why don't you send these this crowd away? There's five thousand men plus women and children. Why don't you send them away so they can go find something to eat?" And Jesus looks at him and says, "How about you give them something to eat?" And suddenly this disciple, whoever he was, and really all of the disciples, found themselves in a severe shortage a severe lack they needed something but they literally did not have within themselves enough to meet the need that was in front of them and then they found some kid with a lunch a few fishes a few loaves and in that kid's hand that didn't do anything in peter's hand that didn't do anything it wasn't even enough to feed him but when they put it in the mighty hands of god the mighty hand of god blessed it broke it and distributed it and this is what will happen when you come into the mighty hands of god he'll bless you he'll probably break you of your pride and then he will distribute you to be a blessing to those around you he will bless you he will break you and he will distribute you this is how god works he blesses he breaks and he distributes and all of it is for his glory so that people stand back and say look at the mighty hand of god look what god did in my hands this didn't do anything but in god's hands it was blessed it was broken and it was distributed and it fed all i mean it says everybody was full and there was 12 bushels left over one for each disciple to take home god says look you guys are in my hands and i have provided for your present and i have prepared for your future but peter was also there when peter thought he knew the plan Peter was also there when, when Jesus said, one of you will deny me, one of you will betray me. And Peter was like the first one to be like, that's not me, I'll never deny you, Lord. See, you can, you can be under the hand of God and not always respond right. You can be under the hand of God and not cross all of your t's and dot all of your i's peter was under the hand of god he was being blessed and he was being broken now because before he could be distributed he needed to be broken and he had this pride thing inside of him he hadn't humbled himself under the mighty hand of god he had come under the mighty hand of god but he had never humbled himself and so he still was so sure of himself he still was so confident in himself And Jesus looked at him, not in a condemning way, I don't believe, but he said, look, before the rooster crows three times, in other words, before the sun comes up, you are going to deny me three times. And again, Peter said, you are wrong. (laughs) This is the arrogance of pride, that even when God himself tells you who you are, you don't believe it. Even when God himself pulls back the layers of your heart and looks at the inside, you you still can't believe it. And so Jesus knows he can't believe it. And Jesus says, okay, but when you return, strengthen your brothers. What? 
When you return broken, then you will start to distribute strength to your brothers. When you return strength to your brothers. In other words, the plan of God isn't just uh, up and to the to right. <laughs> it's not just up and to the right. It's not just from glory to glory in terms of levels. Sometimes glory to glory doesn't look as glorious as you thought it would. And I'm not saying that God planned for Peter to fall. I'm saying that pl- God planned uh, around Peter falling. It's not that God desired Peter to deny him. It's not that God had dictated, well, I really need people to, to mess up <laughs> so that I can get glory. No, uh, where sin abounds, grace does not much more abound. Should we, should we continue in sin so that grace abounds? Absolutely not. But the truth is that God hasn't planned, God hasn't planned you to sin. God has planned for your sin. God hasn't planned you to deny him, but he planned for your denial of him. And that's what Jesus is telling Peter. Jesus is telling Peter, look, 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 look. You're under my hand, which means you're under my plan. And my plan is not always for you to go up and to the right because I know you, Peter. I know what's in your heart and your heart is not ready for up and to the right. There's some things in your heart which you're you're flying high right now, right? It's 2019 and you think 2020 is going to be the best year ever. Like, I get you, I got you. But when you come back in November... Come on, come on, somebody. Yeah, literally, physically, when you come back to church in November after the pandemic's over, then, I'm just, I'm just putting that out there I'm, I'm, by faith. I, then, like, when you come back, and I'm, coming back isn't to a building. Coming back is to the place in your spirit that you were in January. Coming back, when you come back, when you get back to that faith. Because here's the deal. 2020 has rattled some people. Like you thought you were here. And Jesus might have even, God might have even shared some things with you before this. And you were like, no, that's not me. That's just circumstances. That's just that. That's what, and, 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 and then 2020 kind of knocked you down a step. Your attitude took a, took a dive. And your faithfulness took a dive. And your, and your consistency with God and your prayer life took a hit. And your reading of your, the, the Bible took a hit. And, you know, your attendance of small groups, even though they're on Zoom and you just click a button, just took a hit. And now you can't, like, you, you don't get to church on time any more than you used to. <laughs> you're still in your PJs and you're still 20 minutes late. And it took it. <laughs> come on, somebody. Like, it, it's just crazy. Like, you can, you, you, when, when I say that God's plan, like when you're under his hand, you're under his plan. I'm not saying that his plan is always, like, high and beautiful and amazing God plans for our mistakes he knows our hearts he knows our weaknesses he knows our frailty he knew in 2019 what was going to happen in 2020 and he knows where you are right now he's not surprised he's not like well you should be over here look if you're wondering if you're under the hand of God here's 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 the test this, this is how you test. Am I still humbling myself under his hand? Or have I been knocked off of where I thought I was? Have I taken a step down and I started looking around for something else that can give me what I need? Am I, am I, am I worshiping idols or am I worshiping God? Because no matter if you are down here like Peter was, after he denied Jesus three times, or if you're up here like Peter was, uh, you know, after he walked on water, it, 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 that doesn't matter. What matters is what is your heart calling on? What is your heart calling on right now? You say, well, yesterday it was calling on. Okay, fine. But what is your heart calling on now? This is why today is the day of salvation. This is why there's great hope no matter where you find yourself. Because under the hand of God, He has made allowances. He has has made a provision for sin. And that provision is the blood of Jesus. The provision is the blood of Jesus. And if you confess, 1 John, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If you're out from under the hand of God, you can come back. That's what Jesus told Peter. When you return, when you come back. What do you mean when? I'm never leaving. Yeah, okay. But when you come back, 
Jesus is not only saying that Peter is leaving, he is also saying that he will come back. So Peter, Peter doubts his ability to leave, but he doesn't know that that same doubt in his ability to leave is going to create a doubt in his ability to come back. And so Jesus lets him know, you doubt your ability to leave, I'm telling you, you're leaving, but I know that you're coming back. I know that you will return. Why? Because you're strong? No, because the grace of God. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, the God of all grace, the God of all wisdom, the God of all power. To Him be glory, not to you and your steadfastness. To Him be glory, not to you and your good record. To Him be glory. To Him be honor. This is Peter after the fact. I figured out, he said, it wasn't about me and my track record. It wasn't about me and my my ability to never deny Christ. It was about my ability to humble myself no matter what I had done and come back under the hand of God. So I want to give you an opportunity right now, just whether you're watching online or whether you're here in person. I think some of us, A, some of us simply need to rest under the hand of God. First and foremost, some of us just need to stay. We need to settle. That's what he says. He says he will settle you. I love that. He'll settle you. Some of us just need to be settled under the hand of God. That yes, my life is submitted to him. And sure, there's things that he's working on, but that doesn't mean that I'm, 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 I'm out from under the hand of God. He's working on me. That's how I know I'm under his hand because there's stuff that's going on in my life that he's changing and arranging and moving and adjusting. It doesn't mean I'm out from under his hand. Conviction is a sign that you're under the hand of God. So it's all right. You just need the rest. You need to reach out for that hand. Why don't, why, don't, why don't we right now, wherever you're at, if that's you, if you feel like you need to rest under the hand of God, why don't you just reach your hand up to God right now and just say, God, I'm reaching out. This is physical, this is, but it's, it's a spiritual thing. My heart is calling on you. My heart is calling on you. I need the confidence that comes from knowing I'm under your hand. I need the confidence that comes from knowing I'm still being used by you. I'm still being molded and shaped by you. You haven't let go of me. You haven't turned your back on me. And even, and even those who have fallen and even those who have escaped, here's a call to you. If, you've, if you. if you have come out from under the hand of God, are you ready to humble yourself again? Are you ready to return to, uh, to come under the hand of God? If you are, just raise your hand right now and say, that's me. I've been, I've been out from under the hand of God, but I'm coming back under the hand of God. So no matter where we are, whether we've stayed in the hand of God or we've, 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 we've drifted, Father, we come under, we humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God. And this is what he says. He says, cast all of your cares on him. The word care literally means distractions. In the Greek, the word means cast all your distractions on him. Take all your idols. Take all your false ideologies. Take all of the things that distract you and pull you away and throw them on Jesus. Take all of these things, bundle them all up and place them on Jesus so that he is my focus. He is my God. It is his hand. I'm looking to the hand of God over my life. I'm casting all my distractions on him for he cares for me. Breaking down all of my idols and laying them at the foot of the cross. Father, I pray that you would give us the assurance of your hand. No matter where we are, if we're up or if we've taken a step down or if we've taken two steps down. No matter where we are, Lord, would you use your hand? That's what David said. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. These are all things that are held by the hand of God. Correction is in the hand of God. Redirection is in the hand of God. But first we must humble ourselves. Humble is to get rid of pride. An idol. There's no I in team, but there's an I in idol. It's right in front, actually. It's an I doll. We form something, a doll that looks just like me. And we worship ourselves so Lord we get the I out of it we get the me out of it we remove me out of the equation we want to focus on you to you be all glory that's why worship is such a wonderful replacement for pride to you be all glory to you be all honor you have dominion in other words you're in control 
I submit to you. I surrender to you. There's maybe something that God's been laying on your heart that you need to do. And you've been slow to do it. And you've been like, I don't know. I'm waiting for everything to line up. I'm waiting. No, just to be under the hand of God is as soon as his hand moves and pushes you in a certain direction, you just go. So right now, Lord, we commit to be fully obedient to you. We, we commit to be fully obedient under your hand as you lead us. You don't, you're not going to have to shove us and pick us up and throw us someplace. You're, you're able to just guide us. You're able to just nudge us, to direct us. And we'll step out in obedience. Whether that's praying for somebody at a hospital or, 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 or beginning to tithe or joining some, some kind of group or serving or feeding the homeless or whatever it is that you're leading us to do, Lord, we, 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 we commit right now that we're surrendered to the hand. Place our fishes and loaves in your hand. We ask for you to do with us whatever you want to do. We give you all the glory and all the honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Yeah.